for life like those other 600. Exodus chapter 14. I'm going to start in chapter 13 at verse 20. You know this story really well and I'm sure Pastor Lisa and Dion have preached it many times and Pastor Kevin. And by the way, I've heard so much good about the leadership in this church. It's another reason why I'm kind of in awe of you all because this is a very successful, vibrant, Holy Spirit-led church. And Lisa is a wonderful leader and she is just so capable and so wise in her decision making and I just you guys are so blessed to have such a good group of mature people to follow Exodus chapter 13 verse 20 so they took their journey that's what I was going to say you know this story it's Israel 400 years in Egypt as slaves, the gradual increased oppression on them, the calling of Moses to be the one who would lead them out, the plagues, and then this incredible moment when Pharaoh finally gives in and he releases Israel to leave Egypt. And they take with them all the wealth of Egypt. And so three million people around about leave the country of Egypt, and they begin their long journey, a journey that should have taken about two or three weeks, ended up taking them 40 years. They begin that journey through the desert to the promised land. And so they took their journey, chapter 13, verse 20, from Succoth and camped in Etham at the edge of the wilderness. And the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud to lead the way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light, so as to go by day and night. He did not take away the pillar of cloud by day or the pillar of fire by night from before the people. Now the Lord spoke to Moses saying, Speak to the children of Israel that they turn and camp before pi Hahiroth, between Migdol and the sea opposite baal Zephon. You shall camp before it by the sea. For Pharaoh will say of the children of Israel, they are bewildered by the land, the wilderness has closed them in. I'm not sure whether you have ever ended up in a situation that was not of your choosing and out of your control. When I started to think about this, the first situation that came to my mind was some things that have happened to Diane and myself where we've come into a difficult position and we've had to trust God and over a period of time get through that difficulty. But the first one that came to my mind was my daughter-in-law, Shelley, because my son, both our sons have left their wives. It's a terrible situation. But for Shelley, it was absolutely devastating when he left her for a younger woman. And uh, they're now divorced, so that's all sorted. But I just felt for her, and I was talking to her on the phone once, and she was crying, and, and she said, He, my son, he was my impossible dream. And... I just think that there are circumstances in life where it seems like everything has just been torn away from underneath you and you have just dropped down into a terrible abyss and you don't know the way through. And I think for Israel, it must have been a shocking circumstance when the Lord said to them through Moses that they turn and camp in this particular place because those names mentioned indicate that they had turned this whole three million people towards the Red Sea and so to their left was difficult land that couldn't be accessed to their right was difficult land that couldn't be crossed 
behind them was the army of Egypt who had worked out that they really did want a whole tribe of slaves to do their work and they couldn't do without them. And before them was the Red Sea. And this is not just a people called Israel. This is a mass of people who were mums, dads, children, teenagers, old, frail people, young, enthusiastic people. It was families of people. And every single one of them now found themselves faced by the Red Sea. They didn't have any boats or rafts or uh, timber to make something very quickly so they could cross. They weren't necessarily able to swim It was an impossible situation. And if you're in an impossible situation or even heading towards one or even having the experience of being through one, you'll be able to empathize with this story. But if you're in an impossible situation right now, then this could be a word for you. Verse 4. Then I will harden Pharaoh's heart God continues, so that he will pursue them and I will gain honor over Pharaoh and over all his army that the Egyptians may know that I am the Lord. And they did so. They turned in the Lord's direction towards an impossible way through. Now, your situation wouldn't be brought about by God. It would be brought about by worldly circumstances that have unavoidably come upon you. God doesn't send us into areas of pain, but God is with us through those situations. Verse 9, So the Egyptians pursued them, all the horses and chariots of Pharaoh, his horsemen and his army, and overtook them camping by the sea beside Pihahiroth before Baal Zephon in their trapped position. And when Pharaoh drew near, the children of Israel lifted up their eyes and behold, the Egyptians marched after them. So they were very afraid and the children of Israel cried out to the Lord. Probably the best thing to do when you're in an impossible situation and you're trapped is to cry out to the Lord. And what they did was right. But what they did next was not. Verse 11 to 12. Then they said to Moses, because there were no graves in Egypt, that's sarcasm because three quarters of Egypt was set aside for grave sites. Because there were no graves in Egypt, have you taken us away to die in the wilderness? Why have you dealt with us to bring us up out of Egypt? Why have I become a Christian? Why didn't I just stay ignorant of Christianity? Wouldn't have that been so much easier? Is this not the word that we told you in Egypt saying, let us alone that we may serve the Egyptians? For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than that we should die in the wilderness. So they started to complain about the leader I think someone said before oh Lisa that's right look here's the chairman of the board if you've got any complaints bring them to him (laughs) well can I make a suggestion if you have any praise points bring them to Chris and Lisa and Kevin and Les and if you have any things that you're struggling with a bit sure they're available for counselling but complaining is never right. They started to complain about the leader. It so often happens when families or individuals get into a tough time, sometimes of their own causing, more times just because of the circumstance of life, and they begin to look around for somebody to blame. But we don't do that. Because we're people of faith. And Moses, what a great, great leader. And we all need a good leader. And you have an abundance of them here. 
But Moses, what a wonderful leader. He also is in this impossible situation. He wouldn't necessarily be seeing a way out or a way through. But his faith rises in this time. And if you're a leader of a family or leader of some sort of group or a leader in the church or a leader just in culture, I think of Moira Deeming. Look her up and find out about her battles, a young woman who's trying to bring truth into our Victorian parliament and has got all the hounds of hell coming down on top of her. A strong courageous leader if you're in a position where you can be a strong courageous leader even if it's in a single relationship with another person now's your time to arise and Moses rose he said to the people in verse 13 do not be afraid stand still and see the salvation of the Lord which he will accomplish for you today For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall see again no more forever. Confident, bold, strong. The Lord will fight for you and you shall hold your peace. If you're in that situation, don't be afraid. Stand still. You will get through. Your obstacles and opponents will be removed. God is on your side. Be at peace. That's what he said. The next verse, verse 15. And I honestly believe that this verse, a verse that has spoken so clearly to me, is the core of this message for you. And the Lord said to Moses, Why do you cry to me? Tell the children of Israel to go forward. How can you go forward when everything seems impossible? Tell the children of Israel to go forward. And yet there was a a sea before them where they would inevitably drown. There was an army behind them that if they paused would either kill them or take them into slavery. Tell them to go forward. Why cry to me, God said. It sounds harsh, but God had already promised that Israel would enter the promised land. They were on a journey to the land of milk and honey, the land of Canaan. God was with them and he had said, He'll take them there. And so he's saying, why are you even crying? Why are you even praying? Why do you even hesitate? I've told you you're going to get there, so just go forward. But how could they when it looked so bleak? It looked so impossible. And for you, how can you go forward when it looks so hard? But God is going to make a way. He has promised. He's promised our victory. That's what we celebrate around this time and every day. He's promised your healing. He's promised your provision. He's promised to guard you and guide you. God has made all of the promises that we need. And it's not to say we shouldn't pray. I pray every day, every morning. First thing I do is get up and pray. I'm not saying don't pray, but when we're crying out for the things that God has already given, he's saying, don't hesitate. Go forward. And verse 16, but you do have to do what you're called to do. But lift up your rod, Moses, God says, and stretch out your hand over the sea and divide it. And the children of Israel shall go on dry ground through the midst of the sea. So I encourage you, do what you've been called to do. Do what your gifts enable you to do. God does not bless laziness. And God will do his bit, verse 17. And I, God says, indeed will harden the hearts of the Egyptians and they shall 
follow them. So I will gain honor over Pharaoh and over all his army, his chariots and his horsemen. Then the Egyptians shall know, and this is God's plan, that I am the Lord. When I have gained honor for myself over Pharaoh, his chariots and his horsemen, And the angel of God, God, Elohim, who went before the camp of Israel, moved and went behind them now. The one who led them now became their rear guard. And the pillar of cloud went from before them and stood behind them. Elohim, plural word for God. Supreme God. Jesus and the Holy Spirit, our Saviour and the Holy Spirit, our leader in the cloud. And if you glance down to verse 24, now it came to pass in the morning watch that the Lord looked down upon the army of the Egyptians, the Lord, Jehovah, the self-existent one, God the Father, he looked down out of the pillar of fire and cloud and he troubled the army of the Egyptians. So we just learnt that Jesus, the Holy Spirit, and Jehovah, God the Father, are there in the pillar of cloud and the fire. You see, the, the Trinity is always with us. The Trinity can never be divided. The Trinity is here. God is here. God the Holy Spirit is here. But in a sense, God is ever-present. That's one of his characteristics, omnipresent, and he's omnipowerful. But God is here. And if God is here, then the Trinity is here. You might need to study this, and I hope I don't run into too much trouble with my theology. But God can never be divided. He's one and he's three. The Lord our God, the Lord is one. But God is three persons in one. We can't understand it because we are one person in one. He is three persons in one. That's God. He's a different being to us, thankfully. When we are divided, when we die, our body is divided from our spirit. Our spirit lives forever. When... I'll read this because I don't want to get it wrong. When we die, we're separated from our spirit physically. When we die spiritually, we are separated from God. Jesus at the cross, you know how he cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus' spirit was never separated from God because Jesus is God. Jesus died physically, not spiritually. He was never and never can be separated from God because he is God. God is one, but God is three in one. And so here, as the people of Israel were walking towards the Red Sea to put their feet in the water, the Trinity was with them. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And whatever difficulties you are going through at the moment, whatever you face that might be challenged, challenging, I want you to know that the Trinity is with you. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are with you. You could not possibly have a better person, three in one, to walk with you through your disaster or through your challenge and take you on into victory. He never leaves us or forsakes us, but that's not just Jesus. That is God that's with us. You know, God died on the cross. That absolutely blows me away. Some people say, well, God sent Jesus who died on the cross, and that is absolutely true. And I've heard people say, well, that's why I don't want to be a Christian because for a father to send his son to die, that could not possibly be love. But it was God who died on the cross. God who made all things, who is supreme, who is unimaginably powerful and wise and knowledgeable, gave himself on a cross and died 
so we could be with him forever. It does not get any better than that. All of our family members have walked away from Christ. So they were all Christians. We have four families. They've all discovered that they can live without God and prefer to do so. But you know, God has not changed. They haven't made the tiniest scrap of difference to God except in his grief, of course. And we're praying and waiting for them to turn back, which they will. But knowing God and loving God and being with God and knowing he'll take us through the most difficult situations and he'll sustain us in everything that we do. Father, Son and Spirit has got to be the best thing you could ever possibly imagine or experience. And that's who you have. I'm so thankful that we're together in that. I'll just go back to verse 22 because I skipped a bit. Won't take long to get there. So the children of Israel went into the midst of the sea on the dry ground and the waters were a wall to them on their right hand and on their left. This is a strange mystery that the obstacle that they'd had now becomes their wall. So they couldn't be attacked from the flanks because the sea was high on their left and high on their right. And there's a truth which is really hard to comprehend and I'll explain it this way. Our pastor in Torquay, he's about 40 so years of age. He has five boys. He's blessed with boys. And he has enormous health difficulties. He's so lucky to be alive, so blessed to be alive. Here comes beautiful Esther. I have to meet her later. He's so blessed to be alive because anything that comes along or could be experienced in the area of sickness he gets it a few weeks ago he was at youth group it was the first youth group they'd had this year he started to get chased by all of them they ganged up on him and they were playing some game and he fell down a hole can't imagine how that possibly happened one leg was stuck up high got caught the rest of him went down in the hole and he kind of tore a whole lot of things below waist level so now he walks with a stick he's determined to get through without trusting in doctors by the way since COVID but he's a guy who suffers enormously they've lost family members a couple of young children one a baby that struggled for a year and then died. Enormous challenges that he has, not just being a pastor and pastoring a church, which is hard enough. Everything else seems to happen to him. And he said one day, only about a month ago in church, Pastor Daniel said, once you're a Christian, nothing bad happens to you. Yeah. Yeah. And that really shocked me. But what he meant was, you think about all the scriptures about trials and the good that comes out of them. Even that single scripture, all things work together for good to those who love God and called according to his purpose. But there's a whole lot more like that. That in one sense, when we face challenges of many kinds, as it says in James, many diverse kinds, it always ends up for our good. And when the children of Israel went into the water, the walls were what had been their disaster, their impossibility. And if you're going through a serious difficulty or you're facing one, there is this truth that you will become the person through those trials that God always intended you to be. 
that he didn't make the trials, but he will give you the faith and the perseverance and the hope and the people around you to take you through. And as you come out of it, you will be that faithful person trusting him that he always hoped you would be because the greatest thing is that we are going towards heaven. Comparison, compared to that, nothing is really all that important. Not possessions, not family, not the challenges we go through, but this truth that we are going towards a destiny that is with God forever. Verse 24, it kind of comes to an end. I've done verse 24, verse 30. The victory. So the Lord saved Israel that day out of the hand of the Egyptians and Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. Thus Israel saw the great work which the Lord had done in Egypt. So the people feared the Lord and believed the Lord and his servant Moses. And I want to say to you today that if you're the one or ones going through that trial there is a victory on the other side there is something that God wants to bring you to which will be far better than you would ever have imagined I just want to finish with this I'm going to pray for you but I just want to say this about Moses his name means saviour or it could be drawn from the water. You know what happened with Moses. But Moses became the saviour of Israel because his destiny had always been to lead Israel towards the promised land, out of Egypt and towards the promised land and to take them through the desert. That was Moses' destiny. He was called to be one of the greatest leaders of all time. That's why his name means saviour. But he himself was saved by five women. Did you know that? Shifra and Pua, Hebrew midwives, refused to kill babies when Pharaoh demanded that they do. And their names mean beautiful and radiant so they were two women that because of their stand for life, Moses lived. Then there was Joshebed, his mother. Her name means Yahweh is glory. She hid Moses for three months because she also was determined that her baby would not be slaughtered like all the babies were, the male babies at the time. Pharaoh determined to oppress Israel and stop them from reproducing. So this terrible carnage, this genocide broke out in Egypt at Pharaoh's command. But Joshebed hid her baby for three months. And when she could no longer hide her baby, she put him in a little boat and put him on the water. The fourth person, woman, who saved Moses was Pharaoh's daughter. She saw Moses in the boat. She heard Moses crying and her heart went out to Moses, to this little baby. And she suggested that that baby be brought to shore and brought into her arms and she would make Moses her child. And then there was the fifth woman who saved Moses was Moses' sister, Miriam. Her name means rebellion. Oh, God, raise up not just women, but some men who will be a rebel against the culture of death in our country and the Western world and against all the lies that are being perpetrated against us and particularly against Christians. Raise up some rebels. Raise up some Miriams, God. May some rise up out of this group of friends here today that if, Holy Spirit, you're speaking to somebody's heart, 
Lord, put the urgency of rebellion in their heart today that they might rebel against evil. She called a nurse, a nurse to care for Moses. Oh, Pharaoh's daughter, I know someone who can wet nurse this baby for you. I know the very person. That very person was Moses' mum. God's plan. Without those five women, one of the greatest leaders of all history would never have lived. This is a touchy subject, but do you know in Australia, 80,000 Moseses are not given the opportunity to live. It works out 24 babies every daylight hour are killed by Pharaoh, by Satan's evil. It works out at one primary school of children, one average primary school of children every school day. Can you imagine a whole primary school just gone like that today, gone like that tomorrow, gone like that the next day? That's why we do this simple thing to spread life throughout our country. We're anonymously placing 150,000 cards each year right now through our volunteers. But we really want that to be a million. I've just got this feeling in my heart that if we have a million life cards connected to 22 crisis pregnancy centres going out around Australia. Culture must change. Think about it. It's free. Would you like to stand? I'd like to pray over you. I wanted to talk about destiny. I felt that every person here, and I know it from Psalm 139, that he saw you before you were even born. He saw you in your mother's womb. He wrote a story about your life that kind of includes every single day of your life on earth. Destiny. And every baby. And I kind of got really excited when I was heard about Esther. And there's probably other new babies in church too. But this particular baby that was kind of so caught up in this destiny picture with Purim celebration and the timing and the miracle and, and just arriving as a kind of surprise. And God, you are amazing. But every one of you is amazing. Every one of you is God's creation. Every one of you has a destiny. Every one of you was born for God's greatness, which is his fulfillment of your plan, of his plan in your life. maybe you're at a point where you just don't know if you can go through the Red Sea and God is saying to you today go forward go forward go forward for God is with you What an excellent message. I'm sure we all took something away from that today. Encouragement, challenge, inspiration, had everything. Thank you so much. You can be seated, church. We're going to take up a, a special offering for Peter and Diane. But um, I want to do two things, and I'm not sure if I can... S Chris seems to have disappeared. That's right. What's that, Sean? Oh, but Maravik's here and Dion, so we've got most of our board here. Um, Peter, how much does it cost to print those cards? When you send them out. Each time you do it. 
é bom. Yeah. I wonder, um, so as a church, we will, um, separate to what we're about to do now, what we're taking up now is for you personally, and I'll read a scripture out in a moment, uh, but our board, um, I'm a bit confused, because I probably, because I still am a bit fogged in my brain after having a baby, but just about how we support you going into the future, but I think as a board, we would probably love to make a one-off contribution to the printing of those cards. Um, and I won't throw any numbers out in front of anyone, just in respect to Chris as well. <laughs> Obviously, oh, they're bringing Chris back in now. Um, but I think as a church, we would love to contribute to that as well and do something significant with you in the ministry. Chris is there. And that's, I'll, I'll catch you up, Chris. I haven't done anything naughty while you were outside. Because I'll, I'll, you are the chairman of the board, Chris. So, so you have to make these decisions now, not me. Um, but that's okay. But I just wanted to read out this scripture. Um, And I'll read it in two different versions in case you're not quite sure what the first version is. But it comes from 3 John chapter 1. Well, there only is one chapter in 3 John. But verse 5 says, Beloved, you do faithfully whatever you do for the brethren and for strangers who have borne witness of your love before the church. If you send them forth on their journey in a manner worthy of God, you will do well. Because they went forth for His name's sake, taking nothing from the Gentiles, we therefore ought to receive such that we may become fellow workers for the truth. If that was too much old English for you, let me read it to you from the New Living Translation, which says, Dear friend, you are being faithful to God when you care for traveling teachers, i.e. Peter and Diane, who pass through you, even though they are strangers to some of you. Some of you may not know Peter and Diane. Some of us know them quite well. They have told you, the church here, of his loving friendship. Please continue providing for such teachers in a manner that pleases God. God, for they are traveling for the Lord and they accept nothing from people who are not believers. So we ourselves should support them so that we can be the partners as they teach the truth. And I want to encourage you this morning, church, as you give. You already know this. You are a very generous church. We are giving into people who are promoting life across our, not just where we live, but right across the state of Victoria and beyond. And I want you to think about it this morning as you give. Um, Our church will give a separate contribution to those cards. By all means, if you feel a check in your spirit to go and be one of those volunteers, I'm sure Peter and Diane would love to hear from you. Um, So our church will do a separate contribution from our missions budget into that. But what we are taking up now is a blessing that we are going to give to Peter and Diane personally to actually help them with their life because they don't draw a wage from anywhere. They're not on staff with someone. They're purely a faith-based ministry and we want to contribute to that this morning and be counted as someone who says, I believe in life. I believe in children. I believe every child has the right to live. And by giving to that this morning, you are an active part of their ministry. So I hope that makes sense. The church will do a separate contribution Contribution, And this this morning is just us as a church saying, let's bless them as the man and woman of God who have come to us today. For some of you, that's a stranger that will pass through. You may never see them again. Uh, but if you stick around with our church, you will see them again because uh, we love to have them up um, quite often. So if we can get ready to take that up, Sean, that would be awesome. Um, I encourage you to give generously this morning. These are men and women of God who have really gone out as missionaries in Australia. Sometimes we think of missionaries as people who go across the other side of the world and, you know, they do great things for God. But you can be a missionary in your own backyard as well. And that's what these guys are doing. So let's take up our offering this morning. Let's be generous, remembering that's what God has asked us to do. And I 100% believe with all my heart that God will bless you for taking care of His people this morning. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we give you the thanks this morning. We give you the praise for people like Peter and Diane, who you call, who actually go. People who say, you know what, God, I'm going to lay down my life. I'm going to lay down everything and I'm going to sow this into the kingdom of God. Lord, we believe that with this ministry, 3-6 Life, God, that they would start hearing testimony after testimony after testimony of women who come forward and say, but for a small card that I found somewhere when I was walking down the street, I would not have continued with this pregnancy, but this baby now lives because of the obedience that somebody had to place a card somewhere in public. God, we pray for more and more of these missionaries who would go out, who would go out and sow life, who would give life. 
who would love the community around them, who would pray for the community around them. And we just pray today, Lord, for Peter and Diane, that you would bless them, bless them abundantly. We believe this ministry is of you, God. How can it not be? You are the one, the giver of life. And you are the one who came, Lord, so that we would have freedom to be set free.